everybody, this is Victor from Cyborg for Life, and I want to welcome you to episode 118 of Limb Lengthening Live, where the patients interview the guests. And today we are doing an open mic. Uh, we had one last week, it turned out really well, and we're back to do another one because um, I'm looking for some guests. So welcome to the show, guys. What do you want to talk about? <laughs> Let's see who is here. Nobody's in the chat yet. Where's my MVP, Benjamin Minoza? <clears throat> So what I want to start off with is uh, there was a um, UK documentary crew that is doing a doc. They're doing a documentary on, I guess, the aspect of male height uh, enhancement, and they wanted me to announce to any prospective patient or current patient that wants to be a part of it, preferably from the UK. So that is what I'm doing here right now. If you guys are wanting to be a part of this feel free to reach out to me and I can put you in touch with them. So uh, I told them that I would announce it and uh, see if anybody was interested. So, all right. So who do we got here? <clears throat> Mike Green, what's up? How are you doing, man? Hope all is well. My guy, time, time lapse car guy, Bruno. We just call it TLC GP, GP. I can't say it. How are you guys doing? Mo, Mo's in the house. Hello, cousin, King Ruchi. I'm not sure who that is. Oh, was that my cousin from uh, overseas, maybe? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so what are we talking about? Any questions about limb lengthening? Any guests that want to join? The, the join link is in the description. Um, otherwise, we'll just do a quick one. I don't mind that. <laughs> kind of need to run to Costco and get some uh, stock up on some groceries. So been a little busy lately. Do I have any plan? Yeah, so I was going to plan something for today's live, but they just they come so quickly. The weeks turn around so fast. But uh, no, I'm still looking for a guest. I've reached out to guests multiple times. I mean, I can get on, you know, those alternative limb lengthening uh, methods guests. Um, we had Tyler on and there's another guy named Johnny who wants to come on. But um, besides that, I don't have any guests planned. I mean, we know that the Precise Max was kind of recalled or put on a supply hold or whatever. So we're just kind of in limbo right now in the limb lengthening industry. So this is all for you guys. Yeah, so no news. I mean, I, the, the latest news that I have on the Precise Max, like I said, I think it's uh, looking at a release date for J June 1st or something like that. So we'll see what happens with that. I'm not 100% sure. There's my guy. Ben, where have you been at? You, you kept me hold, held up here for five minutes or three minutes. <laughs> but let's see. Um, I actually have, well, you guys can help me answer some questions from my... Uh, um, emails. Oh, wait, did I answer them already? I think I did. Um, uh, one person was asking about surgeons that they should go to and how to pick a good surgeon. I think we've talked about this several times before. Um, and, uh, um, <clears throat> okay, never mind. Um, what was I saying? I don't even remember what I was saying. But anyway, uh, yeah, how to pick a good surgeon. I think that's a big thing. Um, now nah, let's not talk about that. I don't know. What do you guys want to talk about? It's your, it's your guys' show. I don't know. We can keep it short. All right, let's see. We got somebody here. Didn't notice you were live, but I'm so glad that I did just in time. Yeah, you're the guy who always shows up. I swear, when I meet you in person one day, I'm going to give you, like, the ultimate gift. I'll give you, like, a cyborg shirt and... A fist bump from Cyborg. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, Facebook user. Um, I'm not sure why it doesn't say their name. Anyway, is it normal to experience more pain in the longer feet than the shorter one in the case of a 1.5 centimeter leg length discrepancy after dynamic uh, hip screw install installation? Shorter leg is broken. Is the broken one, and the pain is in the longer leg. Yeah, actually, you know, where are you feeling the pain in your longer leg? Is it? Let's see. Where is the pain? Is it like at your joint, like your knee? Oh, look, we got Socrates on the show. What's up, Socrates? But uh, Facebook user, definitely tell me where your pain was because I did experience pain in my longer leg, but it was because I had a little bit of valgus because it was taller. It had to kind of buckle at the knee to compensate for the shorter leg. So, <clears throat> Franco Nordeste. If five centimeters is the limit for conservative lengthening in the femur, what is the limit for safe, the safest lengthening in the tibia? 3.5 or four centimeters? Yeah, I'd like to say 
<clears throat> but you know, it always depends on your starting length of your your tibia bone. <clears throat> I just literally scarfed down some pasta and chicken right before this. But anyway, uh, so it does depend on your initial bone length that is going to dictate what is the conservative lengthening. But usually for most people, it is, you know, around 3.5, four centimeters for people who are like, let's say five foot 11 or six foot, but it depends on your length of your tibia. So, okay. So we have his question here. Um, I had dynamic hip screw surgery back in 12, uh, December and by then, I'm experiencing a leg length discrepancy of 1.5 to 1.75 centimeters in my left leg. Uh, what to do in this case? Again, if I am going to go for leg lengthening surgery in the femur in my left leg, when to attempt for the operation, and how long will it take to walk without any aid or stick from limb lengthening operation, and what will be the implant removal, and when can I run? Uh, I have attached the x-rays of mine. Please also tell me the cost aspect as I am not very, uh, from a very influential family. Okay. So you're in the Facebook group. Um, you know, what I rec recommend is posting this in the Facebook group. I will get an answer to you because this is a pretty in-depth, um, you have a specific condition. Uh, seems like a little bit of a deformity correction as well. Oh, we got some grass there. Um, so what I'd like to do is answer this a little bit more detail because you have a few questions in here that can be you know, depending on different factors. So post this in the group, but basically, um, the cost of, yeah, you're, you're asking. Somebody's testing their sound. Soccer. Nope. <laughs> That's so funny. I did the same thing before I came live. <laughs> Was that you, Sam? <laughs> no? Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, Facebook user, post this in the the group. I'll I'll get an answer to you because that's that's pretty uh pretty detailed. I want to make sure that I'm thorough with that. All right, so we got Socrates and we got Sam on the show. Welcome to the show, guys. Can you guys hear me? Hey, Victor, how are you? Good. Are you driving? I can hear you. I am driving, so I'm gonna mute myself. I'm gonna be home in like 10-15 minutes, but I did wanna um uh, check in. Uh, some of these comments are real interesting. That one that I that you just had up, I, I came in, I was like, man, this man wants a full-on consultation right now. That's really I know. Cool. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty hefty. I, I was like, you know, I don't want to, uh, you know, answer too much, you know, and answer incorrectly. So I was like, yeah, just post in the group. But um, yeah, man, definitely join when you get there. Um, the pain is in the ankle of the longer leg. Yeah, look, it seems like your your longer leg is trying to compensate for the shorter leg because you're only as tall as your shortest leg. That's what it was in my case. So your taller leg, your spine induced scoliosis, whatever has to compensate for that shorter leg, it's going to compensate. So it seems like your ankle's taking the brunt of the load. Mine did too, as well as my knee. Um, yeah, I mean, if you have a 1.5 centimeter discrepancy, it's not huge, but if it's symptomatic and it's bothering you, it might be worth looking into with a surgeon. So, <clears throat> all right. We have this one from Hunter saying, when's the documentary featuring Rich Rotella coming out? Rich and I are, we were just talking to, uh, lawyers that get our producer agreements and our appearance release forms, all that done this week. We paid them some money and we got that squared away. Uh, the next stage is to finish the post-production. We're in that process. Uh, after that, hey, we got we got the the hero from the last uh, stream here, Nail Legs. Welcome to the show. Hello. How's it going? Good, good. Um, so, yeah, the, the documentary is looking to be released, hopefully, let's say fall winter of this year if not early 25 it's coming out it's going to be really really cool um yeah and i'm i'm hoping that it gets into the hands of like a major streaming service like netflix hulu amazon prime so stay stay tuned um who do we got on here nail legs want to answer some questions I can try. <laughs> <laughs> you did such an amazing job last week. I was like, he's going to be a regular on the show. Him and Socrates, you guys are going to be like, I don't want to have you as guests anymore. I just want to make you part of the team. I have, I think I have four slots on here. You guys can join anytime you want, kick people out and all that cool stuff. Because <laughs> we used to have Randy on here, but he uh, he moved back to his normal life, I guess. So, ah, look what we got here. We got Sam. Hey, man. All right. So this question from JM is saying, why are short surgeons like Dr. Uh, M, I guess, Dr. Marie or Dr. D doing the surgery, doing the surgery with Dr. Paley if they aren't trying to promote limb lengthening for short guys? What are they saying, nailed legs? What's that question mean? 
Uh, I got to decipher this one. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> he's got that one. All right, we'll, we'll come back to that. I think he's saying if a short surgeon is short, why wouldn't they do the surgery, I guess, to help promote it for short guys? Well, they don't want to go ahead and take time off from their work. They may have families. They are busy surgeons. Um, I don't think money's the cause. I mean, the reason, but I think it's the uh, it's more about the time for them. Hefe, meeting with Dr. Paley in person next week. I live in Seattle. Any any comments on recovery or PT so far away from your surgeon? Um, oh, you live in Seattle. Okay, you're going to see Dr. Paley. Great. Well, um, best of luck. It should turn out really well. Um, I've been to their institute. It's an awesome institute. It's huge. Uh, yeah. So, any comments on recovery or PT when you're so far away from your surgeon? So, um, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. I don't know <clears throat> what I would say to that. Anybody want to chime in on that? I think the smartest thing to do is to always be, you know, on the safe side of things and the safest side of the thing is to be, you know, local to your surgeon. But, you know, obviously that's not possible for everybody. But, you know, I think if you're looking at it from the perspective of what is safest, definitely the closer you are to your surgeon, that's going to be the safest answer. Yeah, that's a good answer. Will Paley even let you go? I ha You know, the funny thing is, is that, don't tell him I said this, but he has said this after we got, got off that live stream uh, back in de December about the Precise Max. He said that for Precise Max patients, he is considering, don't tell him I said this, that if you talk to him in the consultation, he may let the patient, if they're in the U.S., they may let them go home and do PT. I'll bet, but don't, don't say anything. <laughs> All right. Um, I didn't say anything, guys. But anyway. <laughs> Branco, uh, no Nordeste, uh, would tibia lengthening increase the risk of tearing your Achilles either short or long term? That's a great question. And the answer is yes. Yes, 100%. And I can vouch for this because I had tibia lengthening done. And I know for a fact that when I started to first take my few steps of walking, I felt more tautness and tightness in the back of the Achilles where it attaches to my heel. And if I felt like I was going to bust out into a sprint, I would have ruptured the Achilles uh, right off of the uh, heel bone. So you need to make sure that you give it time to like kind of get back the flexibility. And that's why I really, really, you know, caution a lot of patients who get, they over lengthen their tibias because you're going to look, you're, you're, you only have so much calf muscle. It can only stretch so much. And even if you're growing new tissue, it takes time to recover, but that Achilles tendon does not you know, stretch very well. And it's very easy to tear that. And uh, I think a lot of patients that are over lengthening, when they bust that into a sprint, let's say two years from now, whenever they're fully recovered, they're going to be, they're going to they're gonna find themselves in a very undesirable situation. Do you still have that uh, problem now, Victor? No, or not at all. Okay. I can, I can sprint hundred percent right now. I can do anything. Uh, even when I can do reverse lunges, when your, your calf gets bent almost all the way, like I get, uh, dorsiflexion past neutral. I'm good. Yeah. It's because I gave it time and I rehabbed it and I got back my full flexibility. I would say though, nail legs is that when I compare the dorsiflexion of my right leg, the leg that didn't get lengthened in my left leg, the left is, I think, give or take two to three degrees less than my left, uh, right. Why is that? I don't know, maybe the, the new muscle that was built up in the left, or maybe it is that I lost some, you know, flexibility, but it doesn't impact my, uh, you know, my sport or by any chance, uh, any means. So that's really interesting. Well, wow. yeah. it is. And Dr. Thaler from Germany, we were going to do research on this. Um, and it was going to, you know, have some of his research on the fasciotomy of the tibialis anterior. And he was, he was thinking that it was because of that. I was like, maybe, cause it does make that area bigger. Cause you're releasing the compartment around the sheath around the tibialis anterior muscle. And he's saying that your dorsal flexion was inhibited because there's more muscle in the front part of your, your shin. I was like, okay, that could be it too. So yeah. really we need more data to kind of confirm that. So is he saying that maybe like, so like opening up the fascia, the muscle fascia, is that a bad thing to do then in that case? Or no, it's, it's it's a good thing because it prevents compartment syndrome, which could really it could kill off your your ability to dorsiflex. It could give you drop foot. But the thing is, is that he's saying that that's one slight sacrifice. It's like perhaps a few degrees of a few degrees less of dorsiflexion than. And he found this. He found a statistic in his research, but he was just saying that based on my you know, anecdote that he was saying that that could be the case is because of the uh, fasciotomy. So, oh, wow. um, but we need more people to, you know, vouch for that. So 
Yeah, uh, that, that is like a really interesting topic, though. I mean, you know, it's, it definitely shows how there's a little bit of give and take in there. You 100%. Know, you get, there's a little bit of benefit and a little bit of, uh, you know, cons to it. But that is really interesting. It is. It is. And, you know, that's why I can say that if people say, are you 100 percent? I have to say no. But, you know, like, honestly, I'm no, because I can't fully dorsiflex. But like, does it impact my sport by any chance? I would say probably not um specifically my sport but then you know it also has to do with how hard you train and to rebuild yourself back up so um because you're going to do tibias too right uh yeah plan right now is uh you know quadrilateral so you know going to do it all um and uh, you know that was actually one thing that you know i wanted to do like another little presentation on i i had like a few more ideas i wanted to bring up Please do. Uh, you know, I, I won't go too deep into it right now because I'm still kind of collecting all my thoughts on it. But, you know, long story short, you know, going into the, you know, the peak height velocity, which, you know, we talked about on the last live, you know, if there's a way that we could slow down the rate of growth, but we're using a weight bear, full weight wearing nail to bring the peak height velocity closer in line to what, say, a teenager would go through, could we then theoretically avoid all these complications, right? You wouldn't necessarily need to do physical therapy. You wouldn't necessarily need to worry about, you know, Aquinas. You wouldn't necessarily need to worry about, you know, nerve irritation because you're, you're just allowing your body to heal, you know? So you would say, instead of going one millimeter a day, you would go to maybe, I don't know, 0.25, you know, but so the question would be, we would need a full weight bearing nail, but then on top of that, how do we prevent pre-consolidation? So there would be, there would need to be some sort of you know, way of disrupting the bone formation, you know, not too much to like break it, but at least slow it down. And then, you know, in the long term, that may be easier and make it more accessible to everybody because then you could just go on with your life as if nothing was happening, right? I mean, that's what we all go through when we're children, right? Yeah. So if there was some way to do that, I think that, you know, that could be the future there. You are, you're, <laughs> you're a brilliant guy, you know, that because you're actually, you actually just brought up one of my dreams uh, is to come up with an alternative to limb lengthening. But here's the thing. If you break the bone, if you create a corticotomy or osteotomy where you break the cortical walls of the bone and you separate it, you cut it in half pretty much, uh, it'll heal, right? You have that, you know, the osteogenesis will happen. Those osteocytes will start to grab or the osteoblasts will start to heal. But then um, you have to distract it or it's going to consolidate. That's just what happens with bone. And even if you, if you go too slow, it's going to happen. However, um, as everybody's been hoping that I would bring to the channel, uh, talking about artificial growth plates. If we can, let's just say, hypothetically, take a needle, like you, you know, people get cortisone injections, you just take the needle, you put it into the bone, you shoot it, and, you know, it somehow, you know, creates a growth plate where you, you inject uh, the needle, and you can stimulate this artificial growth plate at the physical plate to, like you said, grow at the uh, natural rate, the organic rate of a, let's say a teen or adolescent at, let's say, I think it's eight millimeters per year. Is that what it was? Yeah. It's like, it depends on which one you read, but it's like eight to nine centimeters, like pretty typical for the average teenager. Eight. Yeah. Centimeters. That's right. Sorry. Um, per year. And uh, if you can keep it within longitudinal growth only, not hypertrophic, meaning that it's going to grow outwards and push on your tissues and cause all kinds of pain. But if you could do this, what did you just bypass? You're ba basically keep the growth plate is technically uh, connected uh, to your bones. So you would get rid of the medical device, I mean the implant. You would get rid of. You can go at your natural rate, so that, like you said, the muscle tissue, all the soft tissue, the vessels, the nerves, everything's kind of going at its normal rate. So there would be no pain. So you got rid of pain, the implant, the expensive implant, and the person could technically walk the entire time and just go on his life, and they just get taller every day. But you would have mm -hmm. to use some sort of stimulant, like or stimulator, or some sort of, uh, you know, device to stimulate the uh, the growth of this thing. That would be the future. That's cyborg yeah. technology, and that's what we need to do, Nail League. So let's sign up. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> let's make some billions of dollars. <laughs> that's the future. I'll, I'll start America. researching that, and I'll get right on it. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna go down to my laboratory. <laughs> exactly, the Nail League's laboratory. <laughs> you, you'd be surprised. There is a lady. There is a surgeon who has talked about uh, synthesizing a growth plate. I think it was done in the lab and it was used for deformity. Um, and I found her name, Dr. Karen something. I can't remember what it was. I came across it because of this alternative guys. And I want to reach back out to her. And there's other guys with the FGR3 gene is on my alternative uh, limb lengthening video. And I want to kind of put together a team and just try this, right? I, I have connections with Georgetown uh, uh, 
Georgetown's um, biomedical de department. And if we could get, just try something, right? Like that's, that's, that's how you break, break uh, barriers. So I don't know. I just feel like that's the future. So, but you had a really good point there. All right, <clears throat> let's move along here. One thing I wonder is, you know, like, and I'm sure there might be a statistic out there, but how's like the dorsiflexion on, say, you compare the average dorsiflexion of like a 10 year old to the average dorsiflexion of like a 15 year old? Because that's when, you know, they're going through those, that big adolescent growth spurt. You know, is mm -hmm. there some restriction there in like the dorsiflexion of the 15 year old as compared to the 10 year old? You know, I'm, I'm curious to see how that you know, maybe it's not because it's, it's slow enough to allow them, you know, to grow into it, or maybe, you know, cause you hear about, you know, like younger kids are, you know, generally more, you know, we're generally more flexible, the younger we are. Um, and even with like the bones, right. I mean, the bones are a lot, uh, they're not as uh, solid as like where the younger, they have like a little bit more bend to them, you know, especially like babies, you know, there's a little bit more bend to the bone there. So I, I just, I wonder like how big of an impact that has on it. Um, and, and I guess that'd be more of a question for a pediatrician. I mean, I'm not a doctor, but you know, it's just something that it kind of interests me. I don't know. No, that's a fantastic question. Um, my theory, because I don't have any data here and I'm just guessing would be that because between 10 and 15, you're also growing muscle and soft tissue, right? So that would kind of, and you're growing more of it. It's like, you're getting more, uh, material to play with. So it would kind of compensate for the growth. So you wouldn't feel like your dorsiflexion is restricted because you'd have more slack to play with, if you will, like more muscle length reserve. I know there was a surgeon I had on uh, way back in the early days that I started Cyborg for Life interviewing surgeons. And he said that, you know, from lengthening the femurs of, let's say, up to five centimeters, which is two inches, your muscles have this reserve slack, which you don't get excessively tight or taut until two inches, right? Like if you're just doing the femurs, like if you did quadrilateral at the same time, that's a different story. But if you're just doing the femurs, they have a reserve slack. And I think that kind of same theory kind of plays in here because it's like the muscles do have slack. They, they can stretch to a point where before they feel this extreme tension and need to actually go into hyperplasia and fiber splitting and create new tissue. So I think that that's <clears throat> why patients get really, really tight. And I think that in the case of organic growth or, you know, natural growth, I think that if soft tissue is growing at its normal rate, then you probably wouldn't run into any dorsiflexion and inability. But I don't know. That's a really good point. Really good point. Socrates, you're back home. Where were you at, PT? I was at the gym doing some uh, of the comments. Like the gym? After PT, so what, what, what's, what's happening day. at the gym? What are, you, what are you doing at the gym? Uh, biking. Oh, okay. Very cool. Oh, they were coming by. You just said that. Yeah, gotcha. Yep. Awesome. Very cool, man. All right, Socrates, you got to answer this question from Quentin Wade. About the valgus? Mm -hmm. He has slight valgus. Uh, how do I know if I should get alignment correction surgery or not? The doctor said that it's within normal, but I have a feeling lingering pain in the knees. I've been feeling lingering pains in, in the knees for the last two weeks. So valgus is below the knees, right? It could be. B, it could be above the knee as well, but it's going to, it could be in the femur or the tibia, but it's most likely in the, uh, at the knee. Yeah. Well, if, if your doctor who's saying that it's within normal is, is not an orthopedic specialist, go see an orthopedic specialist, um, and then discuss because alignment, alignment is intense, right? But you know, a couple centimeters is going to heal quickly. You're almost guaranteed to not have any significant complications. Um, and your life will be better. So I, I would not hesitate. Uh, and alignment is probably going to be paid for by insurance too. Sure. Yeah. So um, it, there, there's almost no negatives if the surgeon says that it is warranted. I agree. Good answer. All right, Mr. Carter or Mr. Carter. <laughs> I'm thinking of Jay-Z here. Yeah. <laughs> M. Carter. Um Hi, Victor. The last time you mentioned that if I do limb lengthening and bow leg correction at the same time, I can take advantage of the insurance somehow. Can you uh, elongate? I mean, elaborate. elaborate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How I would benefit from that. So, yeah. So, like uh, Socrates just said that if you have a significant, um, you know, condition of, let's say, varus, which is bow leggedness, and the surgeon deems it medically nece uh, medical necessity to get it corrected or else it's going to um, impact your health or your long term health, then insurance will cover the correction for that. And if they need, if they can, if the surgeon can use the same implant that they would use for limb lengthening to uh, stabilize the bone when they're doing the correction, then they can justify the underwriting to get it approved for a significant coverage uh, from your insurance. If you have good enough insurance, if the clinic accepts your insurance, 
And I don't know if it would be the entire cost, but it would probably be a good amount. That's what uh, HJ, he kind of did something similar like that. His had, he had rotation. <clears throat> it wasn't um, angular deformity, but he had a rotation and he got a big cost cut. So yeah, some, some clinics will do that. Uh, not all of them, but you have just ask around. So, ah, oh, Sam, your mic, your audio couldn't work. Darn, I wanted to ask you how you're doing. Keep taking the, the videos. We want to see some more of the videos from your discrepancy folk. So. Effie, he told uh, he told me it was possible with the Max to do that also. Okay, I'd have to go back to your question. I don't remember what it was. This is the guy who's asking ah, about traveling yeah. back and forth to Seattle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. He told you that. So, he, okay. So okay. that was under the table. That's right. Keep it under the table, even though we're live. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, like secret secret from Hunter. Uh, I am not currently a patient. I plan on doing it in early, maybe mid 2025 uh, with Dr. Burkholtz. Uh, the current plan is uh, quadrilateral. Um, I am going to be doing a uh, four centimeter uh, on both segments and then uh, re-break. Uh, you know, of course, I may decide not to do the re-break. You know, we'll see when we get there. But, uh, you know, that's the current plan. And then, uh, you know, finish out the whole length of the nail. That's awesome. So the yeah. only person who's done re-break that I've ever spoken to um was bob hunt and i got the impression honestly that the rebreak was nothing compared to the original surgery yeah right it was just like oh mm -hmm. more the same right mm -hmm. so you know i've 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 come across quite a few patients that have done the rebreak and they uh <clears throat> like you said it's not as nearly as bad because i don't know you don't have to remount the bone and all that stuff you just kind of yeah yeah i mean i guess you have to shift the nail i don't know exactly what happens um i'm sure you have to ream some stuff but we'll see uh yeah nail legs you're great danny thinks so <laughs> i'm just kidding everybody danny i love you <laughs> <laughs> you're good you're good yeah but, but for sure man you did such an awesome presentation i'm still gonna clip out your thing and put it as a video but uh feel free to present anytime uh as you can see i need content so <laughs> m carter i uh recently have been having a a weak very mild pain in my left achilles feels like it could pop any second oh no um and I'm doing the surgery in August. Is that enough reason for me to postpone or cancel the surgery? It depends. Where are you lengthening? Are you lengthening the tibias or the femurs? Because that could make all the difference in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I would probably say if you have a very tight Achilles and it feels like it's going to rupture, definitely get that looked at first. Because you don't want to go through something like limb lengthening where you're stretching tissue. And then, you know, it can only make things worse. So, Hefe, you mean like lengthen for five years? Yeah from whatever question that is. <laughs> oh, I think maybe about like what we were talking about before with like slowing down the rate of uh, ah, length. Yeah. I don't think you'd have to do it over the course of five years. You, you'd be surprised that you'd like, here's the thing though. If you wanted to go at an accelerated expedited rate, you could just do more physical therapy. Right. But the thing is, is you're walking around less pain and it's not, you know, chopping up your life because you're just walking around all the time. That would be the future. Like I was thinking about that. It's the value equation, right? Like if you can eliminate pain, money, uh, and you know, just inconvenience. People are going to pay for that. You know, you and theoretically, you could just do it in a year, or at least like the eight centimeter, right? Like if if a thirteen year old is averaging about you know eight maybe nine centimeter a year, I mean, if you could just do the whole length and you start to finish over the course of a year, I mean, I don't really think that's you know that long of a period of time, especially considering the benefits, and you get to avoid all of the downsides. Um, right. You know, of course, it's, it's all theoretical, um, but just yeah. So I, think about. I, no, I couldn't true. imagine doing lengthening just a quarter millimeter a day, though. It, it would feel. You can't like imagine you're doing it. Union is, is, it just seems like it would be so high. But she, I think you were gone when we we were talking about this. Uh, we were talking that, Nail Legs, do you want to kind of fill them in? Uh, yeah. yeah, so, you know, just kind of going off of like the last week's presentation with the peak height mm -hmm. velocity, if there's a way that you know, we could slow down the rate of healing so that way we don't have to worry about pre -con uh, premature consolidation. And then you could say lengthen at, you know, 0.25 a day. You could theoretically get away with not having to do physical therapy, not having to, you know, go through like the pain, you know, the nerve irritation, not having to deal with, you know, any muscle tightness or per perhaps like the, the, uh, uh, the Achilles getting tight, whatever. Um, what you was know, it called? You could S O, I, I can't remember, but the, the name of the syndrome where uh, children going through puberty have the growth is too fast and they get the same issues. Oh that yeah, we get. Ashla, yeah, uh, o Osgood Slatter, Slatter disease. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. So I, so I think what you're hinting at, 
uh, lengthening once or twice a day for like like the distraction phase taking six to nine months uh, with a weight bearing nail would honestly in my book be the best way to do this. Okay, mm -hmm. the least invasive, um, the least damaging. Like you could go back to work. You can't go back to sport, but you could go back to like like an a, a, yeah. a relatively acceptable quality of life. Because you know I I had my surgery four months ago and um, I still can't walk. Right, so it's it's mm. literally debilitating. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's crazy. Yeah, I actually have yeah. a video I scheduled to come out this weekend. It's on the opportunity cost of limb lengthening. There was a patient, he got it done like two years ago, I think, with Dr. Rosberg at HSS, and he said um, <clears throat> that you know his bone was slow to heal, and he was working for a really big you know company, and he was going to get a promotion and whatnot. He had to step aside for a while because of lengthening. And when he tried to get back into the company, it was on, he was unable to. So he had to kind of like, you know, sacrifice that big job promotion and making all this money. Mm -hmm. He started his own business since and he's doing really well, but um, he just wonders what if, if limb lengthening yeah. didn't happen. So I think that nail legs is invention has a lot of merit behind it. If we can find a way around it. And I was saying earlier that if we can make that an artificial growth plate, like we can kind of you know, create this mold, like you shoot like a injection at the site of the osteotomy and it doesn't break the bone. It just converts the osteocytes to chondrocytes, which is like what your growth plate would be. Uh, and then, uh, you know, stimulate it with some sort of lipus technology to create longitudinal growth over time at your own distraction rate, which would be like we said, a quarter millimeter, whatever, over the course of how many years, you know, I don't know. It's really cool. Really cool to kind of go down that rabbit hole. On these uh, talks the past couple of weeks. What's that? I'm hearing a lot of PhD theses. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> Neil legs is, we got Dr. <laughs> Neil Legs in here. <laughs> it, you know, one I think that they could potentially do, and, you know, this is a little bit crazy, of course, I'm not a doctor, but, you know, with the ERC machine, if there was, you know, of course, there's already like acoustic, you know, technology where like weaponized acoustic technology. So if maybe there was a way while you were using the ERC machine, it sent out like a very low impulse, sort of like acoustic type, uh, I don't know, weapon but not really a weapon. I mean, it's, you know, very low level to sort of like disrupt the uh, born bone formation to kind of like prevent that premature consolidation, okay. something well, like that. And then it's all in one and you wouldn't really have to change much. But of course, this is crazy, you know, theoretical talk. I mean. Okay, I gotcha. So you're basically saying if my growth uh, plate technique didn't work, we still have to stabilize the bone with a, a lengthening implant, but we could still lengthen slow enough that it wouldn't create, you know, you could lengthen as much as you want. Um, then you could find ways to slow down bone growth, right? You can use parathyroid hormone, which used in a short duration actually kind of stimulates bone growth because it creates osteoclast activity <clears throat> and then osteoblast activity. But if you did it over time, it would actually create a way, you know, slow down bone growth in the gap. So you could do that, reduce your calcium, your vitamin D intake. There's all kinds of things to slow down bone growth. The only thing is, is that you don't want to create that non-union and there's going to be a lot of testing going on in clinical trials. So that's where you start to like use going to use rabbits and animals and all that sad but you know that's you know that's how we kind of make advancements in medical science so it's yeah. very, very interesting we gotta maybe we should make this our alternative one like any method episode <laughs> <laughs> hey i'm uh, i'm taking patients right now i got a lab in my garage i take payment in uh, chick-fil-a gift cards so whoever <laughs> wants to sign up uh I love let it. me know <laughs> nail legs this one's for you from hunter uh, so I'm currently 167 uh, centimeter and uh, I plan on uh, doing the full, you know, eight and eight, you know, of course, with the re-break re there. So at the end of it, I should be uh, 183. But of course, you know, you have the Q angle of the femur. So maybe it's not going to be quite that, but uh, somewhere around there. Okay. Very cool. Looking forward to it, man. Can't wait to see your journey. Uh, Mike's back. Victor, <clears throat> for someone who's planning quadrilateral lengthening, how would you outweigh the reestablishment of the femur tibia proportions versus the side effects of the tibia lengthening? So <sighs> quadrilateral lengthening. Uh, first of all, what I would do is figure out my interlimb ratio now and like what my bone lengths are. And if you want to maintain that as close as possible uh, to what it is right now, you would kind of figure out what is your goal height. If it's 10 centimeters up, which is about I think it's four, four inches, Socrates, 10 centimeters, give or take. Okay. Um, then basically figure out how you're going to break those femur and tibia increases into like a, a an amount that will kind of maintain that ratio as close as possible, right? And I think like if you're doing 10, a six and four works better than a five and five because it does maintain, give or take, it, it would be more like drastic over time, but 
I think a six and four is better just because it maintains the femur's naturally longer ratio to the tibia than if you were to do five and five. And also think five centimeters on the tibia is more extreme than four centimeters and six centimeters is still conservative for both for the femur. So I think that's the best approach because you're going to recover better. It's going to maintain your proportions and your bi biomechanics better. And um, yeah, so that's my answer to that. Um, Toparge. How do you define over lengthening? Is it a, is it fair to assume that up to five centimeters in the tibia and eight centimeters in the femurs are safe? Has anyone achieved this? No, that's not safe to assume because everybody's different. Everybody's starting point is different. Everybody's bone length is different. Everybody's tissues is different in terms of tightness and stuff. Uh, everybody's work ethic is different, but you can assume that based on an average, I guess, cohort of patients that that is the amount that has been deemed somewhat acceptable by the surgeons in the medical community. So I think that um, those are the max amounts that some clinics have set based on experience, like their experience of doing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these cases. But uh, you can't just assume that for yourself because everybody's different. So Socrates, you want to chime in on that? Uh, yeah, so you got to listen to your body. I mean, if you're if you're starting high, just 167, like nailed legs and I, um, and you're going to try and go for eight centimeters femur versus someone who's starting height is 175, eight centimeters is just easier for a starting height of 175, assuming similar femur proportions. Um, it's just easier for your body to handle. But, you know, the same 163 starting height could handle eight centimeters, no problem, um, whereas we've there are people who started at 170, 175, and um, their femurs could only handle six centimeters, right? So you really, like, your body, you have to listen to your body. Otherwise, you will do permanent damage, and okay. it's not worth it. No, because, and going against, the, going along with that point is that some people can get six centimeters on the tibia, which, you know, kind of goes over this five centimeter mark. It just depends. It, it's all about lengthening and observing. <laughs> I've, I've seen in some comments, like some people ask why, why this community seems to be, seems to single out specific clinics and yeah. throw vitriol at them. It's because they don't prevent that. Yes. The, the yes. biggest risk of the surgery is long-term complications mm -hmm. that are not handled as they arise. Yeah. So... I love that. And, and, and I, and I would be a little bit more direct with, you know, what I would like to say about that, but I'm not, I don't need to do it yet. I have a game plan of how I'm going to handle that because, uh, cyborg for life's mission right now. I mean, first it was kind of like inform patients, build this quality platform. I think that we've kind of gotten that we have the patients contributing now, like nailed legs and Socrates. And I caught, cut you up into a short the other day, Socrates. I don't know if you saw it or not. So thanks. <laughs> so you guys are helping grow the channel, but now the channel is running on its own kind of a way, but I have other, I'm working on the back end to kind of, you know, work on the stigma of the procedure. And how do we fix that first and foremost is going to be reducing complications. And there's clinics that are just constantly going after the money and just trying to get as many patient heads in the door as they can. And they're hurting the reputation of this, this industry. So what do I do to combat that? It's going to be try to, I wouldn't say sway, but like make patients aware of what they're getting into because if they see something they see a end result they may think oh i can get that done and it'll be the same for me but they might just be one of the cases that gets swept under the rug as an unfortunate complication and that's not what we want because any patient that just wants to get an elective surgery to get taller or fix their discrepancy it's unfortunate that they develop a complication that's crippling literally crippling like there's patients in my dms that it's so sad it's so sad that they need corrective surgeries and they were perfectly fine before they even thought about the surgery. So it's pretty serious stuff. So I, I like to be jovial and very lighthearted about limb lengthening, but it's, it has a very dark side too. So, um, Branko, uh, I know a lot of hate for LON for femurs, but, uh, but supposing you were to limit it to five centimeters, wouldn't that eliminate a considerable, considerable amount of risk just to have a clean wound, just to clean your wound sites three times a day and deal with the pain? Look, yeah, you absolutely can, but you got to understand that Neil Legs, he had some really good information on this. I actually made a video out of his um, his article that he wrote on the LinkedIn forum about uh, the different types of lengthening devices, and I think LON was one of them, or at least monolateral fixators were. And um, to tell you the truth is that there's more risks involved with using an X-Fix for stature lengthening with 
with a surgeon who doesn't know what they're doing that you probably would be better saving up and getting an internal nail because there's less room for error, um, if that makes any sense. So I think that if you have a, a surgeon, well, also put it this way, why do they like the top surgeons in the world not use LON? Is it because they just want to make money off the, the nail? No, they're not making anything off the nail. The, the company, I mean, all that goes to Nuvasiv, right? We know that, or whoever they're using it, uh, Orthofix. But they're using it because they know that complications are more prone to happen with an external fixator. So they're trying to do this to help patients. They care about patients. They know this is an elective procedure and if they're gonna take their reputation and put it on the line, they're gonna do it the safest way possible. But if a clinic elsewhere wants to use, I call it an obsolete device to make it more affordable to patients who wanna get this done, well, you can kind of see what I'm gonna say next, so. Uh, may I jump in? Absolutely. Um, so I, I did like a really uh, pretty long uh, thread there on the limb lengthening form. I definitely recommend you check it out. Um, there's the initial post that I made, but then I also went into the replies because there's a lot of back and forth. Uh, there are some people on like the limb lengthening form that do support doing external fixators. And basically the only reason that they do, and they only recommend it. So they're, you know, I don't want to name names because maybe they don't want to be involved in it, but you'll see them if you look on the thread. Uh, what it really all comes down to, the only real benefits that anybody argues that maybe external fixators could have specifically when it comes to the tibias would be the potentially reduced risk of having a uh, fat embolism as there's no like reaming of the uh, bone necessary like in the case of using a uh, Taylor spatial frame. Uh, you're not using, you know, an internal nail like you are even like LON, right? There's no uh, internal nail there. It's all external rings with basically wires that are going in and out of your leg. Um, the only real benefit that anybody could possibly argue is, oh, potentially reduced risk of a fat embolism. But from what I've seen in the data, because I pulled up all the statistics, I cited all my sources, I, I've included, you know, pictures on there, everything, and you can read it for yourself. But there's really, the, the risk really just isn't there. I mean, it's, it's a small risk and it's a real risk. And yes, you should be aware about it. But honestly, in the grand scheme of things, you know, your risk of getting a bone infection is so substantially higher than the risk of you getting a fat embolism. It's way, way, way higher. And, you know, I'm not a physician, so I can't diagnose or say certain things, but just logically, you know, fat embolisms, th those are going to show up pretty early on. So you, the, the way that they're going to know if you have a fat embolism or not is by monitoring your O2 your, your oxygen, your, uh, the oxygen saturation rate of your blood. That's going to be how they know, okay, are, are, is your blood getting oxygenated or not? Because what a fat embolism is, is we have the fat globules basically getting stuck in the, in your lungs. That's basically what it is. And so they're going to know like pretty immediately if you're getting a fat embolism, the big danger one would be, you know, pulmonary embolism, which could show up way day, like way down the line, but that's a whole nother thing. And honestly, you could get that from just about anything, even like non limb lengthening procedures, you could get, you know, that, but in, in essence, there's really not that many benefits to doing the external frames. The only one that you could possibly argue is maybe a fat embolism, you know, the, the risk of reduction going down with that, but otherwise, I mean, it's just not there. And, and like Victor said, I mean, all the best surgeons in the world are moving away from it. It's not to say that they don't use it, but it's not like their first line of defense. They're generally going to want you to do uh, internal nails. I mean, heck, he, even Paley, right? I mean, he he pioneered, you know, LON. I mean, he, he used to do that. Um, and now he doesn't, you know, and, and many other surgeons, I mean, they'll do externals as well. I know like, uh, Dr. Asiag, you know, in, in some cases, you know, he may do externals there, but there's a reason they moved away from it. And it's definitely not their first choice. It's just, it's really a cost reason what it all comes down to. And people don't want to be honest with themselves. The reason they're doing externals is because of the cost. And I mean, that's okay. I think, you know, the debilitating nature of, you know, just living in a, in a world that's plagued by heightism, I perfectly understand why people are willing to do anything it takes, no matter, you know, the, 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 the potential risk, why they're willing to do that. But honestly, if you have the means to, you should really just do an internal nail. I agree. Well said, well said. And, 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 you know, to add to that point, I think that one reason why someone would use something like a TSF, Taylor Spatial Frame, or an external fixator, like a ring fixator, like the Elizarov or whatever it is, is because of deformity correction, right? Like we know that they're mm -hmm. still used for that, but they were created for that. Internal nails were saying, hey, if the person comes in like Socrates with perfectly straight legs, 
why use that, right? Like we're going to straighten his leg with a straight nail and then he's going to be taller and then he can go back to normal life. Like why does he need to use the external fixator? It's because, I wrote about that uh, pretty uh, intensely on the forum. Uh, did you? But, yeah. give me, give me, if you can put it in the private chat, the link, I'll, I'll go ahead and post it below this video so people can check it out. Just put it in the chat after we're done or actually during that. But um, yeah, that'd be great. But yeah, uh, Branko. So to answer your question, um, yes, you could deal with the pain and you could deal with cleaning your things and you could turn out well because there's a lot of patients that do. I just think that you run the risk of running into or you increase the risk of running into complications. Like he said, pen site infection is almost guaranteed you're going to run a course of antibiotics. And if it's it gets carried away, it could lead into, like you said, bone infection. And is it going to be like you can get a debridement in time that it's not going to go deep bone infection and osteomyelitis? We don't know. I've seen those cases pretty pretty regularly. So um, I don't know. I, I just, I'm just, I think that device should be phased out for stature lengthening specifically. I think that when you think about the evolution of the lengthening, you had the X fixes, you had the, um, you know, the lengthening over nail, lengthening, and then nailing. Then they went back to lengthening over nail, and then uh, then it's like the monolateral X fixes. And you know, look, I think it's time for them, to, for them to get out. I think more nail companies need to come into play so we can reduce the cost of the internal nails, and then every stature lengthening patient can be happy. And you know, for deformity corrections, sure, the X fixes will still be there for multiplanar correction. But yeah, that's just my thought on that. All right, we're moving on. Socrates, you're taking this next one from Captain Planet. Wait, wasn't that a show? <laughs> wasn't that a show? Oh my gosh. Talk about throwback. flashback. Yeah, throwback. Go ahead. Throwback Thursday. Go ahead, Socrates. Oh, you had, this person has other questions earlier. Oh, did they? He's asking us to look at his earlier questions. Oh, oh okay. Captain Planet. Captain Planet. Let's see. Let me scroll up here. All right, I didn't see anything. Did you see anything? Nope. All right, post it again, Captain Planet. I think Captain Planet, didn't he have like teammates or something on his team? So it was the five uh, children from five different parts of the world yeah. that had like these rings. <laughs> and they would put them together. And with their powers combined, he was Captain Planet. <laughs> I gotta go back and just like search for those episodes. I'm just gonna binge them tonight. That's, oh, that's, that's <laughs> Thank great. you for that recall, uh, Captain Planet. That's great. I'm gonna answer your question just for doing. That. Okay, I see. He. Oh yeah, this is the same question. Same question. Oh, so yeah, didn't have 45 a.m. here. Could you answer my questions? So like, okay. We would if they were there, but unless yeah, they're you know hidden somehow. Is that his? Uh, he looks like the same. Like kind of. Oh, now it's a different thing. But um, okay. This one from uh, Fine. Okay, what's your opinion on pure external Ilazarov and the LRN or LATN tibia, which is lengthening over nail or lengthening and then nailing of the tibia in terms of chronic knee pain or knee range of motion risks? Um, I don't know. I'm not a surgeon. So I would say you know that with the LON and the LATN, those are, they have nails as part of that, you know, procedure, right? Like those lengthening over nail. So the nail is internally, you know, uh, implanted and you have the external fixator, which lengthens, and then you have lengthening and then nailing, meaning that they have an X fix and then they implant the nail after the lengthening to stabilize the bone so you can, you know, get around and, you know, um, you don't have to wear the X fix as long. So I think that the lengthening and then nailing is going to be the most efficient for getting away from that because you're going to be able to move your leg for full range of motion because you don't have an X fix and maybe the lengthening over nail too. But look, I think chronic knee pain can happen in any of these procedures if it's not done correctly. It has more to do with like chronic knee pain has more to do with like bone alignment because of the stress that the knee is going to take. So but range of motion. Yeah, the X fix is going to be the worst, like the Elizaroff and then depending on how long you have the frame on for the LON versus the LATN, that's a toss up. I do remember on the forum, a lot of like the pro external guys were arguing, you know, for that one of that was one of the reasons the fat embolism, but also like that knee pain thing. Cause of course mm -hmm. you don't have to go through the knee. They were arguing that. And of course um, I'm not a doctor. I can't say, you know, look, I would like to actually argue for that because I had internal nail through the they had a transpatellar approach that she put the the implant through my patellar tendon and at first i was worried about that too but it's not the tendon that hurts it's actually my meniscus that was hurting before because of the discrepancy so i actually have you know from years of squatting really heavy but my tendon using ace them and like you know 
scar tissue realignment, which like you can use grass and technique. I think ASIM is better. It's more involved. Uh, but basically, you know, breaking up scar tissue and realigning the fibers and just taking lots of collagen, vitamin C, you know, and, you know, all these different things. Um, I think you can heal the tendon significantly. Yes, it's still scar tissue. You do, once you touch soft tissue, it doesn't heal back like bone does. But I think that knee pain for that, for with a surgeon who's skilled and they go in properly with the grain of the tendon, not, you know, horizontally with the grain of the, the tendon, you're going to be good. You know, they have to be skilled. If they just chop your tendon in half, yeah, you're going to be jacked up. You're not, you know, so, um, but I don't think knee pain is, I, I didn't like it. Let's say that. And maybe in 20 years from now, maybe I'll have a tendon rupture. Who knows? But I'm not going to be squatting at four or five or doing crazy things anymore anyway. So, all right. Uh, Danny, your friend, uh, Nail Leg. So you take this one. Uh, so, yeah, like, I mean, like, uh, you know, the guys in the forum, they argued, you know, if you're doing pure external frames, right, you know, you're, so with the Elizaroff, not lengthening over nail, just ex pure external frames, theoretically, there's an argument that you could avoid potential risk of fat embolism and a potential risk of, you know, like that knee pain like Victor went into. That's their argument. I think the benefits still, it the the, the downsides of it are just too great. Um, you know, you're talking about, of course, the scarring is going to be way worse, but you have to consider also like the infection, which, you know, could be life threatening. Um, you're basically guaranteed to get pin site infections because you have to understand with external frames, the entire time those frames are on, you have an open wound the entire time and they can't heal until you get that removed. Um, of course, you know, you can make an argument, well, if it's just pin site, you know, it's, it's, you know, just superficial infections, you know, you know, low dose antibiotics, maybe that keeps it at bay. But I mean, I don't know, do you really want to take that risk of getting a deep bone infection? I mean, theoretically, you could lose your legs. Theoretically, yeah. you could lose your life. Uh, the, the benefits just aren't really there for me personally. But, you know, I will say again, I totally understand why people do the external frames from the perspective of it's way cheaper, making it way more accessible. You know, it depends on you as an individual, how debilitating, you know, your short stature is to you. If it's that debilitating where you're willing to do anything, well, I mean, I understand, I get it, but you really just need to understand what you're doing isn't the best way to do it. Well said. If you're willing to do anything, honestly, just spend another six to 12 months working and saving as opposed to six months of pure, unadulterated torture. I agree. Like, it, it doesn't... the the risks and rewards of just working and delaying your surgery until you have the money or mm -hmm. borrowing it from someone like figuring out your finances. Uh, they're just so much easier to handle down the road than any complications from doing X fix versus modern techniques. I love that. Elizaroff was originally for people who had catastrophic damage due to war. Yep. Right. So yes, it's worth it. Okay. But cosmetic stature lengthening, yeah, not really. I love that. And that's pretty much the opportunity cost of using an external fixator frame versus an internal nail for uh, stature lengthening. I love it. That was beautiful, Socrates. And nail legs. That was great. Basically, we're saying Nuvasive, sponsor us. We just sold you <laughs> another 20,000 nails. <laughs> well, Fitbone was coming on the market, I think, right? I, I, I heard that, but I think that's for a bone transport, which is like for deformity as well. But um, I, I'm I'm sadly disappointed with you, Orthofix. I gave you the opportunity to come on and partner up with Cyborg Flave to create the Cyborg nail, and you said no, or you kept silent, which is basically saying no. But anyway. Um, Nuvasive, well, if anybody's interested, you. I have the uh, the nailed legs nail. I make it in my backyard. <laughs> So, garage just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> and it comes uh, in at least colors, like a, right? A MTN now, which looks like a, like a like a knob of a um, of a drawer or a kitchen yeah. sink, right? So that's another. I, I think it's weight bearing too, but it just that's a huge open wound, and I'm just yeah. like, what are we even doing? Like, do we it, want people to be um, you know crippled for life? Because that's that's what it looks like. Does it keep your leg open? I, I didn't. I, I didn't yep. look at this. But D, that's the MTN. If somebody sent me that uh, in my email. I said, "Check out this nail." And I'm, I come across it a few times. I didn't look into it too much. I know it was developed or invented by that guy over there. Uh, is it Egypt? It's in Iran. Iran. Okay. Yeah. yeah so we I'm chatting look at about it, and it's just like, not. It does. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. 
people do anything for her <clears throat> to get taller. Um, all right, so let's crank through some more of these. I know we're approaching the hour here, but let's see. Alan, uh, oh, I skipped one. Well, he's asking about nicotine. Yeah, just don't smoke or don't use any nicotine. I can have. I have a video on smoking and limb lengthening. Watch that video; it has some research in it. Alan saying, "Will this it be?" Question is why do we? Why do doctors want our uh, nicotine levels below low before surgery? Yeah, any doctor is going to want your nicotine levels to be low. Period for your entire life. <laughs> they're a good doctor <laughs> exactly <laughs> so don't smoke especially before that might be the litmus of us a good doctor you ask them hey how do you feel about nicotine if they say right. i don't mind then you run out the door run out the door right the red flag <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. um will there be any type of spine lengthening in the future from alan here uh the answer is, is there is spine lengthening now um i think nuvasive is believe it or not, primarily a spine company, and they do have spinal lengthening devices and whatnot, but it's for deformity. Like, you know, we're talking spinal bifida, uh, scoliosis, very badly, you know, very bad. Well, that is type of, had a form of scoliosis there, but like, it's not for stature lengthening. You're not, they're not going to mess with your spine for you gaining a few inches. It's too risky. Um, there will be way more leg lengthening inventions before a spinal lengthening for gaining height. I can promise you that. Machiavelli, like it. Is it better to achieve full athletic abilities before limb lengthening or doing limb lengthening first with average athletic abilities and then focus on achieving maximum athletic abilities after? I love this question. This is a great question. I'm going to ask you guys to take your like a brief take at this because this is actually a really good one. Uh, Nail legs, what do you think? Uh, definitely. I mean, the better physical fitness you're in, I mean, the easier it's going to be on you. Um, just general health. Uh, yeah. Definitely try to you know achieve the best that you can. Um, one other thing to think about, uh, so I know a lot of people on the forums, you know, and even on the lives, you know, they ask questions about, you know, oh, is my athletic potential going to be, you know, lowered, you know, before or after one thing to consider is, are you yourself a professional athlete? I mean, how many people here are actually doing professional sports? I mean, certainly I know Victor, you do, I mean, you know, you do stuff and I know Socrates, you know, you, 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 you know, you cycle and whatnot. Yeah. Um, you know, so some people are very, very serious when it comes to, you know, their sports, but how many people actually are, I mean, even just watching this, how many of you are, you know, concerned about, oh man, you know, I, I run a five minute mile, you know, and it's going to be five thirty after a six minute. I mean, honestly, you have to look at the benefits of the, the, the newfound height versus the benefit or the downsides of, oh, I'm a little bit slower, but uh, if you're not a professional athlete, does it really matter? I think not. I'm not a professional athlete. If I, if I can, if I run, you know, 5% slower, I don't care. I just don't care. It, it, I'm not a professional athlete. That's not how I make my money. And it's not going to, you know, reduce my enjoyment in life. The only thing that really matters, I think for the majority of people, not all people, of course, Victor and Socrates are different for the majority of people is being able to get back to, you know, your hobbies. You know, if you are just like a recreational hiker, you just like to go hiking, you know, for fun, you know, getting back to that being pain free and not having any sort of mobility problems is the key. But, you know, if instead of being able to climb that same mountain in two hours, it takes you two hours and 10 minutes, who cares? I don't. Maybe you do, but I don't care. I love that. Socrates, what's your take on this? What does full athletic abilities mean? Like, as a human, if you have the range of motion to do what you do on a daily basis, then you have full athletic abilities, right? Um, Beyond that, like where you don't need to increase your speed for the surgery to go better. You don't, you just need to stretch and schedule. <laughs> Get those x rays, right? Keep it simple. I'm, I'm going to clip that one too. <laughs> sure. Stop overthinking this. Just stretch and schedule. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, Machiavelli. <laughs> All right. Um, Great question, though. I, I think that I agree with both of these guys. I think getting in decent shape, be healthy, right? No smoking, uh, stretch as much as possible. Make sure you have good cardiovascular fitness because it does help with like nutrient delivery to the, you know, the recovery site and whatnot. But I do think that you don't need to like if you say, hey, I'm going to get limb lengthening done next year. Do I, I need to start training like I'm going to train for like, you know, the World Olympics or something like that? No, you don't have to do that. You just want to be in good shape. Right. But the thing is, is this is that after limb lengthening, you're going to be you're going to build this level of discipline that you didn't have before. Like I guarantee you, Socrates, from going to all his PT sessions and going through this grueling process, his, you know, takes it and like bouts it with marathons going forward and whatever he does is going to be on a whole nother level. It was for me. Right. Because limb lengthening changed the way I worked out the mindset that I walk in the gym, it's a different me. I'm smiling now, but when I'm in the gym, it's like, walk the hell away from me, you know? So, um, 
And it's because of the fact that you build this, this, I don't know, this psychological body armor. I call it cyborg mode. That's what I call it. And um, pretty much it, it, I think that your athletic abilities are going to skyrocket back to where they like a certain percentage of where they were before. The question is, if you're strategic in how you rebuild, not rehab, because everybody should rehab back to full athletic abilities, meaning do everything to get you through a daily, you know, your daily routine. But based on you, how you rebuild, if you're building muscle, strength, speed, endurance, whatever those factors are, if you focus on that, you can get to a very, 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 very high level of what you were preoperative, uh, preoperatively that you won't even know the negligible difference. Okay. And I, I can vouch for this. It's just, you have to have a really good surgeon to make sure that everything is done you know, structurally perfectly. And then it's up to the patient to do the rest of themselves. So I, uh, I agree with both of these guys, but I think that focusing on getting healthy before surgery and then going ham after surgery is the key to go is the key to do. So, um, this one from that name, Scomance, <laughs> um, Five centimeters is not safe. Stop the cap. Just made me laugh. It's not safe. Okay. I don't even know what he's saying. He doesn't believe well, it's five safe. Five centimeters, LON femur. Oh, that's okay. Well, LON femur is not safe. Yeah. Point blank yeah. period as an absolute matter of fact. <laughs> right. Um, sorry. Yeah, I agree. I don't I don't like that. It's the, 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 you know, saving the three centimeters doesn't actually lower the risk. You're at the open wound. Yeah, sure. It, it decreases the amount of time your wound is open, but the the severity of the damage to the muscles is not negligible, right? Yeah. So yeah. do all one femurs if, it, if you have to, right? But I well, honestly don't. I, when I when you look it. at pictures of LON patients, I mean, I just think like, golly, that's yeah. hurt. Yeah. I mean, you see like these big it's, rods yeah. just sticking in there. I mean, geez. <laughs> there's, there's a lot to be said about, you know, looking at it from the outside. And you're like, oh, I can handle it. But like the bone pain is... You just want to die. Yeah. Okay. And so compounded with muscle pain and being stretched out and being probably alone and misunderstood, like it's it's just not it's worth it. Why are you torturing yourself? Right. Look, I don't know if you you dealt a hand that you're not comfortable with in terms of height or or um, uh, limb discrepancies, right? It just to fix it that way. It's just it's brutal. I, like I, I had a discussion uh, a couple weeks ago with with Dr. Asag if if it should be considered medical malpractice, and he was like he wouldn't go that far. Okay, but it's it's really it honestly doesn't make sense to do it because yeah. the costs, both opportunity costs and actual physical costs of having to do a bunch of additional surgeries compared to just the traditional or the, you know the modern uh, internal nails. Mm -hmm. you're, sure, you're saving some cost on the actual nail because the X fix apparatus is much less expensive, but then to go under with anesthesia and everything multiple times for any random complication, it just, he w he doesn't do it by default because of that. It doesn't make sense. I know uh, Paley's talked about that as well, where he's had patients come to him needing, you know, corrections because they go to some butcher and they wind up spending more money because they're having to get all these extra procedures, you know, more time lost if he if they would have just gone to him in the first place. Yeah, so true. So true. And, and, and guys, I had a monolateral external fixator on my femur from a, getting hit by a car and breaking that femur. And uh, it was painful. It was actually more painful than the internal nail on my tibia, way more painful. And it left these hernia like protrusions because where the the pins went in right it's breaking the fascia of your it band that's fascia right that's keeping the mm -hmm. contour to your lavastus lateralis which is your outer quad muscle once you puncture that think about taking a knife and just pushing it in from the side of your leg all the way to your bone you will rip the fascia and then when you pull it out after the frame is removed well guess what that fascia will heal but it's going to leave those puncture marks because it healed around it so you have these permanent like hernias, these little, they call it muscle hernias, which now the vastus lateralis, when you warm up or work out, or get a lot of blood flow in there. It's going to push the muscle out. You're going to get these four or whatever, however many like pins, pins are going in, protrusions pushing out. It's very, it's aesthetically not appealing. It's not very pleasing. And uh, I got mine corrected during my uh, lengthening. My surgeon actually was like, you know what, I'll fix that at the same time. No problem. She actually revised it, put some mesh in there and fixed it up. It looks better now. But the thing is, is that you're gonna have these really bad, and it causes mus muscle tethering too. So when you put it through the soft tissue, you're gonna inhibit or like you know restrict your range of motion because the muscle is gonna kind of contract and recoil around the spot of the pin, and you're gonna 
probably inhibit the maximum range of motion you can get for physical therapy, walking and stuff. I know we're really hammering away and just killing the X fixes on this talk, but <laughs> for when it comes to stature lengthening, I don't think it's, you know, beneficial. I know there's one patient who's a discrepancy patient. He's in Thailand and he said that he has to get, he was going to be on the talk a few weeks ago with the discrepancy patients, but couldn't make it. But the thing is, is that he, his insurance is only going to cover an X fix and a Lizeroff circular ring fixator for X fix for his femur. And I'm like, look, please pay out of pocket. Like you're, it's just not worth it. I know that it's a lot of money, but at the same time, I don't know. Anyway, all right, let's move on here. I know we're, we're moving slow, but this is a, this is a good discussion here. Um, Skillman said, just uh, lengthen, just lengthen at four surgeries gradually. I, I'm just doing femur and tibia this year, and after two years, repeat to get 26 centimeters. Okay. Socrates is going to take this one. <laughs> I saw the 26, and I was like, oh, please tell me that's a typo. I don't, I don't even want to think the amount of permanent nerve damage you're risking. Like, I mean, good luck. <laughs> good luck, exactly. Which, but, what's the surgeon please. that's going to do this for you? I want to know, so I can put them on blast. You know? Me. He's coming to my backyard. <laughs> Nails lights are taking your license away. <laughs> it was nice, nice, dude. Why not to the max? Somebody said, "Why not 30? Go 15. <laughs> Just round it up. Go to fifty. <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh my gosh, man. Wow. All right, all right. Let's see if there's any like real questions. There's six five, so they're joking around here. They're trolling. That's, um, yeah, that's <laughs> it's all fun and jest, but like. Hey. Yeah, maybe he's. And once it. you go under, like, once you get into double digits, you're in extremely dangerous territory. Yeah, yeah, I agree. All right, there's a few more questions in here, and we'll uh, chop it up. So this one here from um, <clears throat> Moki Bear: Do you think limb lengthening will ever get cheaper? This is always a common question. It'll be. It's been like ten years since the precise uh, the price of the surgery has been around the same. Yeah, look, I think until you have to kind of break it down dissect what is the cost of the surgery we have the surgery the surgeons doing the surgery we have within that is the anesthesiologist the hospital costs and whatnot but let's just say the surgery costs the implant cost which is the nail and or the xfix the implant cost then you have the rehab costs and then you have the accommodation costs and then opportunity costs of what you're missing out on like in terms of work or whatever like you know so there's always a cost of it but let's just pick the surgery cost because that's what you say do you think limb lengthening will ever get cheaper and under the surgery let's umbrella the implant i think that's where you're going to need to start first because the surgery itself hospitals are you know the anesthesia is going to get paid a certain rate the surgeons are getting paid a certain rate the hospital is going to take a certain rate especially depending on how many nights you stay i think uh, up in hss it's astronomically retarded <laughs> what they take for the hospital cost per night it's like i think it's like 10 grand a night i'm like wow um <laughs> but uh i think that when you talk about will it get cheaper we have to alter that one big x factor which is the implant cost the nail cost or whatever it is and i think that until other companies come out with new devices it won't change it may even get more expensive when one company monopolizes the industry that's why you know i'm shocked with all these biomedical device companies out there they see this industry on the rise why aren't they jumping in well i think what do you guys think it is that they're not jumping in it's one big word that starts with an s stigma stigma the stigma of the procedure that's why they're waiting because they've seen so many complications they're like Oh, we want to keep our hands clean. Even the, the company that's monopolizing the industry is keeping their hands clean. On their website, they say nothing about cosmetic stature or anything. They say discrepancies because they think that is a medical necessity. That is a noble cause for them to create these, you know, telescopic implant devices. But until a new device or device companies come out, that's why I'm trying to battle the stigma so the com the industry can evolve and grow. That's what I'm trying to do. So I'm trying to dent the, the 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 industry and move it in the right direction, but it's like we have these clinics that are hiring marketing companies and doing all kinds of damage, and people think that they're they're just you know it's I'm just not moving fast enough. I don't have enough manpower, if you will. So, um, but you guys are helping out with your content, your presentations, things like that. It's going to get the word out there. So, the documentary. So I'm working in the back end to do as much good to kind of help the industry move forward. Then the companies will say, hey. There's not as many complications. People are getting, you know, favorable results. They're getting taller. They're getting back to their normal life. There's no pain long term, no long term ramifications. This might be something that we want to, you know, invest in a device. Hey, we're striker. We can do it. We're, you know, uh, you know, any other company will come into play. Worth a fix or whatever. So, um, okay. 
I don't see this one. You know, like, yeah, so these are just kind of like question questions. You're going to look super good. They're, they're still trolling on this guy about the <laughs> 30 centimeters. Slenderman maxing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for people watching, I mentioned this at the beginning of the stream before you guys came on, but there's a uh, UK, I guess, company media team that's creating a documentary on looks maxing. I don't know if you, you guys probably know what that is, but um, I've heard of it. It's kind of like the red pill, blue pill, whatever black pill thing, white pill. Uh, anyway, they're creating a documentary and they wanted me to, to kind of like announce that they're creating a documentary. They're looking for any perspective or current limb lengthening patients going for stature lengthening that may want to participate in the uh, documentary. Uh, will there be some sort of remuneration? Maybe will they pay you? That might be a thing. You just have to reach out to them. If you want to reach out to them, reach out to me. I'll put you in touch with them. Um, I think it's more on like male... Um, body alterations so like you know like guys want to fix their face and fix this thing and then you know i think limb lengthening is in there i don't think it's going to put it in a bad light i think it's just creating awareness around this movement of looks maxing so i was like okay i'll announce it. it's not a it's not going to harm anything of what we're trying to do it's not like we're gonna you know promote any clinics that are butchering patients or anything like that so if you guys are interested feel free to reach out to me and i'll put you in touch with them cool all right uh, let's see may what... i yeah sure uh, so the uh, the black pill content, a lot of it makes a lot of sense, but I will say it attracts the worst people imaginable. Yeah. I would say to to keep that stuff at arm's length. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the content itself. Okay, you know, got it. You know, heightism, right? I mean, that's something we all acknowledge here. We 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 get that. We don't deny that. It's just the community that it creates is probably the most vile communities you're ever going to witness. So I definitely recommend it to keep that stuff far away. I, I love what you said, and that's actually why in the Discord specifically, there's like my Discord and there's another Discord. I think in the other Discord, they have like all these like black pill look, looks maxing like sections and uh, channels within there. And I was like, I don't want any of that in the main server. But like I, I also talked to these guys on the on WhatsApp on a call, and I was like, hey, before I even consider, you know, like announcing this, uh, let me just hear what they're doing. They're just kind of making, they're just creating like a sub, not a subjective, like a kind of like a objective view of what's happening. It's not like so much like, uh, you're right. It's a, it's a very vile community. And I understand what it was when I, when he told me what it was, but, uh, I don't think it's going to bleed over and it, it, because a lot of patients that get this done, they have the same intentions that you want to get it done for Socrates. It's more for like the height alone. Um, sure. You may want to get like a hair transplant and that, that's part of that, I guess, in a way, but I don't think it's going to. I, I, the way the vibe that I got from them, it was a it was a pretty decently positive vibe, and I was like, you know, we'll see what happens. So, but that's that's a good point. Like, I'm never gonna so talk on this channel about looks maxing. It's just not my thing. So, um, stop shaming. <laughs> External fixators. The pain is for three months with those on. You think it's for three months? Yeah, but what about if you get a complication? And I've seen a lot of complications. They run a lot longer than three months. But anyway. You know, society will always find reasons when you're different from the norm. Yeah. Okay. Um, this channel is so cope. What does cope mean? I don't even know what that means. I've seen that in a few times. I would just ignore those kind of comments. Just trolls. Oh. Yeah. Are they trolls? It's, I, it's I meant as an insult. Don't worry about it, Victor. What's that? It's meant as an insult. Let it go. Oh, it's, it's an insult. I, I would love to uh, talk to this person, you know, like figure out what, what you know, what it is, what it means. Um, because I've seen that, that comment a few times, but I love to, cause I, I I'm not the type of person to just like, oh yeah, they come I, I want to get in the person's head. Cause I've done that a few times. Somebody was like, oh, you, you look super slow on this video or something like that. And I was like, Hey, you're watching the wrong video. Watch this one. And I put it in there. He was like, oh, that's much better. It, sometimes they're just confused about what they're saying. They're, they need a little bit more understanding. So I start there. If they're just being a troll, then I say, like, Hey, let's, uh, yeah. let's meet in the gym. <laughs> <laughs> the, the best way of it being like the best intention is is kind of like like analysis paralysis where it's like i need to deal with this and i don't know how to i really want to but i'm just not going to i'm just going to mm -hmm. read about it or listen to it gotcha. forever right so that that's the the most benign interpretation of cope gotcha. Gotcha. it gets a lot more negative where it's like you're just doing this because you're not good enough at life or you know just oh. get therapy bro or uh, similar stupid oh, okay nonsense. Gotcha, gotcha. No, I understand that. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Thank you for uh, explaining that. No, and I, I completely understand that. I think that, like Socrates says, it's like you're stretching schedule. You know, I think that you know to some extent, you know, you got you can't you announce this paralysis. You don't want to like 
overwhelm yourself and get because if you go down to any rabbit hole like if you start looking into new shoes for weeks and weeks you're like oh my gosh like should i get the black or the red or should i get the white laces or the you know blue laces it's like you can get analysis paralysis over anything and limb lengthening is another thing because it's a major attribute like height or you know whatever so i agree with that so um cool all right let's see here nail legs this one's for you from tapar she's saying nail legs dr pilly offers up to five centimeters for each um for each femur and tibia three weeks apart with the with the advent um of the p max this target might be even more achievable is there any reason for your conservative goal of i guess four and four? Oh, uh, that, that's a really good one um i you know the way i see it is you know at least on the precise 2.2 that's all you know dr burkholz has available at his clinic you know it hasn't gone international yet um and so the max is eight it's also eight on the p max so i guess it doesn't really matter either way um but if I'm going to do the rebreak, then I figure I might as well just split it right down in the middle because I'm going to achieve that same goal all the same. But, you know, it's going to be overall easier. Of course, you know, on the, on the last rebreak, it's going to be even easier. But on the upfront, it's going to be harder because you're squeezing out that extra, you know, one and one on each segment. So I guess the way that I see it is if I'm going to do the full length of the nail and I'm going to do the rebreak, then I might as well just do the four and four and, you know, I'll get back to, you know, healing faster and whatnot, because I'm still going to have to do the rebreak later down the line anyways. Yep. Good, good point there. All right. So, uh, okay. So that's your, your, so you post it in the Facebook group. Okay. I'll check it out, uh, later this weekend. Um, And I mentioned you in the Facebook group, Victory. Okay, gotcha, got it. I'll check it out. Yep. Have you guys looked into some studies uh, suggesting a higher leg to torso ratio is associated with shorter lifespan, <laughs> increased risk of cardiovascular disease? That may be, I don't know, what were their sample sizes and uh, is it from limb lengthening? Limb lengthening is artificial leg lengthening, right? Like it's, I mean, you're lengthening real tissue. It's really your legs, but it's like, it wasn't like how you were born. It wasn't congenital, so. It's kind of like the studies that, um, that suggest that uh, being taller leads to mm -hmm. a shorter lifespan yeah so let's say someone is six five naturally what do they do get like limb shortening like like just you know <laughs> it's correlation what can you do right and, and honestly when you go under surgery like you know if if that's the case it's yeah i'm not gonna go down that month anyway um your diet and your um nutrition well they're the same thing your diet and your exercise and your daily habits like who you marry is going to have yeah. an infinitely bigger impact on your lifespan than than you. your legs. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Whether you get married, you know. <laughs> All righty. Uh, let's see here. I'm just trying to see who hasn't asked any questions. We don't. I don't think I got one from this guy, Audrius. He's saying maybe just take uh, Mac credit cards and move to a country, get the surgery done, and don't go back to repay the debt. No, I've heard about that before, and it. It's not going to work out well. They'll chase you down somehow. Don't worry. They got there. Yeah. Some, yeah. He's suggesting criminal activities. Exactly. We don't want that. <laughs> not financial advice, right? <laughs> I'm not authorizing that. But anyway, uh, Orthoget. Yeah, I haven't heard anything, any updates on them. That's the other internal nail company from Poland. Um, these comments are crazy today, Martin. They sure are. I got Definitely. You. <laughs> they're all over the place i love it weather Lots gets a little nice and people start coming up with all kinds of stuff exactly right uh, i'm lying spine lengthening for height is not possible what do you you mean it's not possible what are you talking about it's they they fix they they lengthen the spine all the time but have you seen well, this it's literally a thing it's a thing right now go to nuvasive's website and look at all their devices i promise you'll come back saying i'm sorry <laughs> stature lengthening vice in your spine, no surgeon would of, of, of any merit at all that has like a single ounce of decency would even yeah. consider that. Right, right. And and when I say lengthening, I will. Well, <laughs> I guess you don't have decency, <laughs> 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 you got the, the you garage, right? It's garage, right? <laughs> Come check out the lab. <laughs> the lab, the nail legs lab. <laughs> um, but but I think that you know so. When I talk about fixing the, sc the scoliosis and stuff, it's actually straightening of the spine. So it is lengthening the spine. It's just lengthening it into like an aligned, you know, form. Like, are they lengthening like your vertebrae and stretching your spinal cord out? No, they're not going to. That would be that would paralyze you if you rip the, you know, your 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 spinal cord. Um, so they're not doing that. 
uh, but the vertebrae can lengthen. They can stretch. There's inter intervebra intervertebral space. Um, that's why, like, when you hang from a bar for a, an extended amount of time, you get that temporary height increase. So, same thing. Vic, will we ever get a special lengthening device without any surgery in the future? That's what Neil Legs was talking about. Go meet him in his garage. He'll hook you up. <laughs> uh, One, no two, three cares. broken legs away. I know, right? <laughs> Oh, they're all over the place. Man, I'm just scrolling here. I can't even get to the questions. Man, okay. Yeah, um, these comments are wild. They are wild, man. Is this really legit? Uh, I'm trying to wrap this up, but let's see. This surgery seems like some David Goggins. <laughs> it would be a great story to tell. I'm telling you, that's what, listen to these interviews, man. There's some crazy stories in here. And uh, I think Rial has some really crazy stories. <laughs> He's going to be a poster boy one day. He's going to be on one of those TED Talks or something like that. Like, yeah. Just got to push through the pain. <laughs> Where's my guy, Real, today? Anyway, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, Kirk saying, know any cases of people getting addicted to opioid after limb lengthening? No, I do not. How much risk is opioid addiction? I think it's minimal. Look, like Socrates said in a previous discussion, I think that when you're in extreme pain, you're you're taking enough to like cover that pain, and when the pain's gone, you're. I, I haven't heard of any person getting addicted to opioids after this. That's never been a concern, and naturally, you feel like crap. So you you're gonna not really want to take it anyway um i don't know socrates you can probably speak on this because you're doing it right now uh, the doctor's not going to give you enough to get addicted okay you're going to get like 10 days at a time or a week at a time you know 30 pills is not going to last you 10 days if you're in enough pain to actually need it if you're abusing the pills from the gecko you are already addicted and you should really get help before the surgery um but like no the the risk is very low and if you're worried about the risk, then modulate which painkillers you take and alternate between kind of the more lower level painkillers like Tylenol, ibuprofen, what have you, um, and the intense opioids and only take those as needed. They're not, you're not prescribed to take them four times a day or six times a day or whatever. You're prescribed to take them as needed, no more than this much. Yep, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Uh, I've had a few right. uh, procedures, you know, throughout my life. And, you know, whenever I get the opioids, I always just only use it for when I try to sleep because my sleep, you know, if serious procedure, you know, you got to go to sleep and, you know, the pain disrupts it. So, you know, I'll take it for then. But, you know, otherwise during the day, just tough it out. That's what yeah. I've always done. Same yeah. thing when I tore my pec tendon, and I was given it, I think I took it for the first four or five days, just to, like you said, go to sleep and just kind of chill out. Uh, so I wasn't feeling that constant throbbing, aching and stuff. But after the first week, I was just like, you know what, Tylenol. And then I was just kind of like handling the pain. So, uh, all right. So let's take a last, let's do a last five. I, there's a lot of questions there. I appreciate you guys showing up and asking. Okay. This is keeping it lively. Uh, but let's see. If I can only do 100 pound squats now and sprint 12 seconds, uh, 12 second, 100 meter, good job. That's pretty decent. Uh, will I be able to squat 500 and sprint 10.5 seconds, 100 meter if I work really hard? Can I win a Bra Brazilian jiu jitsu and amateur, amateur kickboxing matches if I work hard? I think you can do anything if you work hard. I think there's going to be any, if you're getting, if you're talking about after limb lengthening, I think there's going to be a huge adaptation period or adjustment period because you're going to have to learn your new center of gravity, depending on how much length you get. Uh, you're going to have to learn your new biomechanics. You're going to have to learn your new like walking gait and like all these different movement patterns. But um, I think that if you get it done, like what nail legs is doing, it's biomechanics is going to be maintained significantly. And it's going to be a lot easier transition. A transitory period is going to be perfectly kind of almost equivalent. You're going to have to learn, obviously he's going up. What is that? <laughs> Is that like six inches? So you're going to be like, there's going to be a huge change to your body, um, your center of mass. So you're going to have to like learn that. But once you get that down after like two months or so, you're going to be able to do almost everything you want. So I think patients fear what they're going to lose when they don't even use all this stuff. But if you want to do those things, I do them as soon as possible because there's no guarantees after limb lengthening, right? I didn't know. I just knew that my pain was bad enough that I needed to get this done. And if I sacrificed bodybuilding, I was willing to do it apparently because I didn't have this channel. I didn't have any information. I just bootstrapped some videos I saw online. Let's uh, sign me up. This I, I want out. Um, like Nail Lake said, if you if you're short and you or like you're, you're a shorter stature and you want to be taller, if that is more painful than you risking what might be on the other side then you do it. But the thing is, is that based on these patients coming forward with their recovery videos and what they're saying and Socrates' recovery and all these different people, you can kind of learn a little bit more of what to expect. And it's looking very favorable for the patients. So, so you're not going to add 400 pounds to your squat. 
Yeah, yeah, no, you're not going to add 400 pounds. Here. So that's you're probably going to be better off adding that by eating a lot and training like crazy. Uh, hit me up, I'll, I'll hook you up with a program. And working out for two decades or something, right? <laughs> exactly. I don't think talk I about, ever hit talk it. about leg day every day. <laughs> right, right. I think my all time best, which actually after leg lengthening, because it happened a year and a half, I think it was like it had to been like it was 2014. I squatted 475, and nice. it was because yeah, it was like less than I think it was. It was it 2014, 2013? It was like a little bit after limb length thing, and I did it because I was crazy. Um, I did some of my best lifts, and talking about patellar tendon, I reverse lunged with 125 dumbbells in each hand. I actually have a video of it. I'll have to share it sometime. So I pushed my limb length and recovery pretty darn hard. I think your re rebuilding phase is a lot more important than you know what you're worried about losing. Blue pill channel unsubbed. I don't know what that means, but okay. <laughs> uh, can you? Vocabulary is not blue pill is the idea that you're um, buying into what society is telling you. Yeah. And so I, I think he may be implying that he, he's probably joking. Right. Yeah. Because um, he would have just left if he was actually upset. Um, or he might think that we are implying that heightism in society is acceptable and therefore we just have to go along with it. And gotcha. we're not. Heightism is not acceptable, but it's a fact of life. You're not yeah. going to convince everybody to treat you um, the same as they would treat someone they they don't think is short. Um, mm -hmm. And also the discrepancy issues, like that's not a societal thing. That's not a blue or black or red pill or purple or whatever color of the week. <laughs> you know, if your leg is shorter than your other leg or your arm is shorter than your other leg, your quality of life is objectively lower yep. than it can be, which is why insurance will pay for it. So... For discrepancies, I, I um I have no idea how that how makes no sense, right? Possibly blue pill. Yeah, this guy Alexi's saying the same thing as you. He's like, <laughs> so um, how uh, come in our Victor? Have you seen uh, the Matrix movie? I have way back, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the first one kind of goes into it, yeah. Oh, oh, the red, oh, no, Morpheus yeah. is like takes a red pill or the blue pill. Uh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, okay. That this makes sense. comment here, Alexi is implying that. Uh, a lot of people who are black pill. The black pill is the idea that, you know, you think it's over for you and you yeah. know, life, you've just been dealt a bad hand and you can't do anything about it. And like, we're actively talking about breaking our legs to do something about it. Like <laughs> it doesn't get more extreme and in involved than that. Right. And, and shelling out tens of thousands of dollars and taking months to heal. Like this could not be less black. pill. Right. That is so true. That is so true. I gotcha. Yeah. I think I looked at an article about these colored pills before and I just went in, in one eye and out the other. So I was just yeah. like, you know, whatever. Uh, how come our, how common are little DVTs in limb like the knee? How come? Um, so uh, you can go back to watch um, video interviews that I did with surgeons. That's probably going to be your best uh, resource to kind of find that out. But they're really good clinics um, that you're going to take blood thinners or anticoagulants. And you're going to be moving around a lot. It's pretty low. It's like under two and a half percent, something like that, three percent. So it's really low. And even if they happen, you know, a lot of times you won't even notice it because you're if you're moving around enough. But if you're like statically in a wheelchair or bedridden and you're not moving around and not doing PT at all, you run the risk of getting one more. So there's a. a Difference between, you know, like victory, you know, you touched on it there. There's a difference between the deep vein thrombosis and a pulmonary embolism. So the, like yeah. the deep vein thrombosis is basically part one and mm -hmm. your pulmonary embolism is basically part two. You right. can't get a pulmonary embolism without, you know, the deep vein thrombosis. So the trick is to prevent that to begin with. But even if you do get DVT, it doesn't necessarily mean you are going to die right. uh, or, you know, be hospitalized. Now, if that progresses into, you know, it gets dislodged, moves up the artery, gets into, you know, your lungs. Okay, now this is life threatening and you need emergency surgery. But, you know, it's, it's a stage thing, right? Most surgeons will prevent stage one, but that doesn't necessarily mean it'll even go to stage two. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's, that's kind of what I was getting at. Because like, when you take a blood thinner, it usually doesn't allow the coagulation and, and like the clotting uh, to happen so significantly that it would turn into a DVT in the first place. But, you know, uh, and when I said, you know, percentage wise, that was more for like the pulmonary embolism part. But it, you're right, it's a stage process. And it's like, you're going to get checked, you're close to your surgery, you're in contact with your medical team. So it's all about staying, giving the feedback that they need to hear. Uh, masculine society, you say these surgeries are going to decrease in cost. Why the hell? Did it increase? Like I literally compared surgeons before four years and now it's just got five. So there's a few reasons for that. Inflation, uh, 
monopolization of the medical devices used in the um, surgery and demand, right? But like, how do you lower that? It's going to be better, more supply, right? We know from economics. And then obviously, um, well, more demand too, like and more supply. And then uh, new inventions, it's going to like open up the envelope. So it's just, you, you, this is a relatively new it's not a new procedure it's been done for years but what i'm trying to say is like a kind of like it's really been highlighted in the last i'd say six years since 2018 since you had this big boom right 2018 2015 it's really taken on this big boom effect for stature lengthening um which is kind of like you know really in the limelight now so um okay nail legs what's your wingspan from quentin uh, about five nine so oh, uh, wow yeah, I have a pretty long uh, wingspan, so it, it kind of. So I, I think I'm in a good spot for limb lengthening, you know, because I'm basically my height. I'm three inches under. The only thing is, you know, when I do it, I'm going to be three inches over. Now, yeah. you know, I've talked about this before. Would you rather be short with good proportions or tall with bad proportions? Mm. Mm, I think the good. answer is pretty simple for most. Yeah, that's a good one. All right, Machiavelli, it's not getting cheaper, bro. Welcome to capitalism. You could be right. I just feel like we haven't seen the big boom of the medical device companies. Wait till the stigma gets destigmatized a little bit more and you see people like Stryker come out of the woodwork with their 17, 18 billion dollar revenue per year. They're like, hey, in internal nail, that's 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 like a flick of the wrist for them. That's nothing. Nuvasive's like, I think Globus's revenue, I looked it up, I think it's like maybe two billion a year. So it's like they're cranking out nails like this. Imagine with Stryker or uh, what's the, another company here? They could come Siemens. out with them. Rebecca Dickinson. Siemens, exactly. Right. Like you go down the list. Uh, so they would transform the industry in half a heartbeat. I, ex and I, yeah, with a flick of wrist, like they snap their Thanos snap. And then like, we have like 10 nails out and then they're like, Hey, pick your surgeon. All these surgeons are jumping into it. And they're like, Hey, I'm doing it for 50 grand. Hey, I'm doing it for 65. We're talking the U S other people are like crap. And the big ones, the big dogs, the experienced ones, like the, the name brands, they'll still stay at the top. Right. Cause that's a price anchor. But then you're thinking about everybody else, like the new surgeons and stuff, they have to lower the price. They have to commoditize. So it's going to be cheaper when new devices come out. You're just monopolizing because we have new vases saying, Hey, our nails are $30,000. You, what do you do? You have surgical costs. You've got to get a, a small profit margin in there. And, uh, you know, so it's a very tight squeeze for surgeons right now, believe it or not. It's the the device company. So, um, but we'll see. You could be right, Machiavelli. I could be eating my words in a few years, but we'll see. All right, guys. Let's see. Uh, man, this is like a super popular show. It's because Socrates came. <laughs> Thanks. And they were like, people I wanted, wanted more. They were like, we need that presentation. And if it doesn't give us, we're just going to bombard you guys with questions. Exactly. <laughs> uh, what chemotherapy? I don't know. That's a surgeon question. I don't know. Um, but Ooh, good question. Wow, that is. I'm yeah. I'm glad you healed from that because that, that is a lot. No. All right, I'm just scrolling through these. Yeah, they're just talking amongst themselves. Uh, this one from Kirk is it unlawful to dis disclose your history of cosmetic limb lengthening when do donating sperm or when planning to have children? Can you oh, can I take can this? You yeah, go ahead, Nail Legs. Take that one in the garage. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hey, so uh, fifty dollar Chick Fil A gift card. You know that's my starting price, um, and I'll, I'll fix you up real good. One hundred percent chance of uh, osteomyelitis. So uh, you know, just hit me up. You can send me a DM on the forum. Uh, anyways, uh, so with that, I uh, as far as with the donating sperm, I can't really speak on. A lawyer would probably have to answer that question. But when planning to have uh, children, absolutely. Um, I'm going to have to explain to my futurative wife, hey, honey, we have to put our kids on aromatase inhibitors and HGH or else they're going to be short like me. And she'll say, what do you mean? You're not short. You're six foot tall. Uh, well, there's something I need to tell you. So, <laughs> you know, I plan on telling her that because, yeah, for my kids, you know, I'm thinking about them. That's fair. That's very fair. That's nice of you too. Cause I think a lot of these guys are not going to tell them. They're like, I went up six inches. Like I'm six foot. They should be six foot. Darn it. What's going on? <laughs> so I, I'm seeing this, this woman and I started seeing her towards the end of lengthening. So she asked me um, how tall I was. Uh, and I said five, nine, yeah. cause that's how tall I am now. Um, and then, you know, she was like, that's perfect. And her response, it didn't really sit well with me. So mm. I kind of just sat on that for a little while, and then I messaged her earlier today. I was like, "What 
do you mean perfect? Like if I was five six or six foot, would that be like more perfect? Like what what's going on there? And she was like, I'm five five, so five six would have been a no go. I was like, well shit. Rest in peace, my former self. Um, and six foot would have been too tall for her. And I was oh, like, oh wow, interesting. Okay, so I guess I, five nine is in her mind perfect. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, yeah. That's that's crazy. That's interesting though. I did not think that. Well, I guess maybe for her, the the six foot would be too much, and then the five nine. She's thinking about like, you know, like that's the uh, threshold. She doesn't wear her. heels, so she doesn't. She doesn't. Oh, okay, okay, I okay. got gotcha. you. Yeah. You know, I, I experienced the same thing, and I, I shared on the last live where basically, you know, some girl we were, you know, she was comparing heights with me, and she did the, like the hand across whatever, and she mm -hmm. said, "Well, as long as you're taller than me, I don't care." And you know, at that point, I was wearing shoe lifts and uh, like thick heeled shoes i was definitely much shorter than her and so like you know that was like a moment for me. i was like damn like if i wasn't wearing these like this would have never happened yeah yeah that's a very common uh thing i hear about from patients for this like on consultations and stuff and they talk about the shoe lifts thing and they're like wow you know what's it gonna be like after i was like what well, it's gonna be a world of difference after but like you know it also highlights the superficiality of our our, our, our society so um i saw in the in the chat that DJ Cyborg asked me if somebody offered me half a million dollars to reverse. Would Is he I? There? Uh, he was uh, about oh. an hour ago. Uh, Absolutely no. not. Are you kidding me? No, <laughs> no, no, I, no, no. They couldn't offer me $500 billion. And I know. Okay. Really? Yes. Dang, that's crazy. I'm not going through reversal. Like, yeah. no, no. That's all. He has his mind made up. That's crazy. You know, I, I got to agree with you because I think that. There are people who ask, like they'll email me and they'll comment, they'll say, is there leg shortening? And I understand that from a perspective of like, let's say you're a, a female and you're, let's say six foot one and you're done your sports and stuff like volleyball, whatever it was. And now you're thinking about settling down. It's really hard for you to kind of find a partner. And it's just like, you just feel uncomfortable. It's kind of like, you kind of have to see it from the same thing of limb lengthening, right? Like being, being short, but like for you, who is like headstrong about getting taller, it's like you, you you can't see it that way. So it's like, I, I completely understand what you're saying. Well, that's the thing. They're going to give me the 500 grand and I'm going to shorten. I'm going to turn around and spend the 500 grand to lengthen again. So it's <laughs> right. <laughs> true. It'll break even and you're just going to go through a ton yeah, of pain. Wasting a bunch of time. Right. And you the opportunity costs all the time I could have been working and just living life. Right. Would you say nail dig? Sorry. You know, something that I think would be really interesting, you know, for like the interviews, if you could find maybe a, a female patient who wants to get limb lengthening and a female patient who wants to get limb shortening and yeah. have them both on and to explain, because that's, I mean, two sides of, of the coin there. We've got complete opposite sorts of, uh, you know, mindsets. I think that would be really, really interesting and like really just educational. That would be amazing if i could find a female patient that wants to do but the one is probably five foot tall and the other one's probably six foot three all right so they're they're, they're yeah. living fundamentally different lives yeah the extreme yeah. opposites but but i would do it i would set it up i'd say i'd be the mediator and i just kind of like facilitate the interview but the only problem is is that finding a female patient to come on like i had a few sparingly throughout the series here but like it's so hard to find them and when they do email me they don't want to come on because i don't know it's a very male dominant procedure right like and it's because height is kind of technically a masculine trait, uh, at least in our society. So, but I would like to, I would love to do that nail legs. That, I'll have to write that down. That's a good one. All right. Let's see if we can kind of crank through these. If there's anything, do you guys see anything that should be answered in the last two questions? Cause I know we've uh, somebody made a quick comment. Let me make sure I read it. Don't okay. go to anyone except Europe or USA. Okay. Uh, Korea. If you speak Korean or if you can get a translator, absolutely. Dr. Mm -hmm. Lee is, is highly recommended. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Kuchikaya. In Turkey, mm -hmm. I guess Turkey is, uh, is Turkey in Europe. I don't know. Um, okay. uh, and then, of course, uh, Burkholz in South Africa. He, you you cannot underestimate how good he is. So, right. It's I mean, Europe and U.S. as default starting point for consultations is good, but there are other options out there. Hundred percent. They have some in Australia. They have them all over the world. The thing is that you just gotta you just gotta kind of understand what you're looking for. And I think that right now there's a lot of content out there from clinics that are, yeah. We'll, we'll get into that another day. We're, go, we're going way over time here. But um, yeah, uh, holding up Victor from getting his Costco hot dog. Come on, guys. <laughs> exactly. I know. It's going to be shut down. <laughs> still dollar fifty. I won't go tonight. Good close <laughs> still the dollar fifty. Oh, man, you're pushing it. <laughs> I want a pizza, but come on. Uh, Victor, can you kick a punching bag with full force in your length and tibia? Absolutely, I can. Um, I'm left leg dominant, but I'm not very 
what's it what's the word uh my dexterity on the left leg is not very good in terms of like kicking i could i can do it though i can do it i'll have to do a video of like a new uh rehab video of stuff all right let's see um we i think we answered this one earlier i think it jumped back up so let me scroll all the way to the bottom here uh yeah it did jump back down so we're almost done here um socrates how, long, how tall would you want your kids to be <laughs> taller than me taller than you okay that's the reason boys the girls whatever's whatever they're comfortable with exactly okay and they're just talking about themselves okay guys awesome i appreciate everybody who showed up today uh in the chat um this is a really really engaged lively chat this is awesome um, Nail Blakes, thanks so much for coming on. Socrates, uh, Sam for trying. I know that the audio didn't work, but we'll have to get you on next time. Uh, really appreciate you guys. Um, so yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm, I've reached out to a few guests, uh, hopefully to get them on. I'm just waiting for their availability, but in time, I don't know, next time we'll probably just do another open mic. It seems to work out really well. We answered some good questions and moving the, the content forward. Um, let you guys have any ideas for what we should do next time. Nail Legs, I know you said you want, might want to present. Oh, what was that? I'm sorry. You said you might want to present sometime. Uh, yeah, I've uh, I've have a few more ideas, but you know I want to take my time. You know, make sure it's quality. Perfect. Cool, sounds good. Well, all right, guys. Well, uh, yeah. So for Socrates and Nail Legs, this is Victor from Cyborg for Life for episode one eighteen of Limiting Live. Signing out. We'll see you guys next time. Peace. See you.